So we're at Fort Larned National Historic Site in western Kansas. It's a Civil War era fort that uh, was set up to protect travelers along the Santa Fe Trail. We're here with Ranger Brian Miller who's going to lead us around the fort and, and tell us some of the highlights and, and life and what it was like uh, back in the 1860s. We're one of the most authentic frontier forts you can find. Uh, so when Fort Larned is actually originally established back in 1859, uh, we have different buildings. Uh, the stonework that we have today comes after the Civil War. Uh, before that, it was uh, adobe structures, uh, much like Fort Union in New Mexico. There's a height of conflict with the Plains Indians out here. They start building all of these stone structures. And uh, after the fort closed, it closes in 1878, so about 10 years after these are finished. After it closed, it became a private ranch for a little over 80 years. The fort is established specifically in this area because a mail station is attacked in 1859. Uh, so they sent a group out basically to protect the mail, to protect the mail station and the mail routes. All right, well, let's take a walk around. All right. Okay, so now we're, we're inside the barracks. What, what do we have here? It's, it's quite the assemblage you have. Right, so this is called a squad room. Uh, and at Fort Larned, there were actually four of these rooms because each room is designed to hold a company of soldiers. A uh, company is roughly 100, and at least ideally 100. Usually it's smaller. Uh, this room historically had Company C of the 3rd Infantry, which is on all the hats in the room around here, and they had 68 men. Uh, so because of that, we have sleeping for 68. And these bunks are pretty tight quarters. Uh, there's actually four guys per bunk bed. There's two on the bottom and two on the top. And I notice on the, the bunks you've got names. Are those the actual names of the soldiers that were here? Yeah, so those are actual soldiers from Company C who was here. So they're going to eat in the mess hall, which is uh, just across the hall here from us. Yeah, pretty simple. Um, this is, if they're here at the fort, this is where they're going to eat all their meals. Um, of course, not everybody's necessarily in here at once. There's some who are out assigned to guard duty. There's some on the Santa Fe Trail. Maybe some who's sick in the hospital, things like that. Um, but you could have up to 100 guys in here. Um, back behind us, there's a kitchen. Uh, so each company has their own mess hall and their own kitchen. Uh, for cooking, it's kind of hit and miss because you, it's just going to be a fellow soldier who's assigned to do the cooking. Wasn't a specific chef? No, no. So it, it was a, just an extra duty that would be uh, assigned to you by, the, by one of your company commanders. And if you did an extra duty for more than, I believe it's 10 days, they had to pay you extra. So a lot of times they just switch before they hit that 10 days. So sometimes you have a decent cook, sometimes not so great. The Buffalo Soldiers had two squad rooms, or any of the cavalry units based here had two squad rooms. That's because, of course, they're on horseback, they have more supplies. Uh, but once the Buffalo Soldiers are uh, chased out, essentially, in 1869, uh, they later turned this into the hospital a couple years later. Uh, one thing that's interesting while we're standing here is you see this bright yellow floor. Uh, this is the only floor that's painted here in the entire fort. Uh, and that's just because when they turned this into the hospital in 1871, uh, if you have a wood floor and you get blood or anything on it, it's going to soak up and stain it. So they decided to paint it. So that way the blood or anything would sit on top and you can clean it right off. So there is a cholera outbreak uh, during the fort's time. There is a couple deaths from it, but luckily it's not a huge outbreak here. Uh, but most of it's related to drinking bad water. Uh, of course, when they didn't test their water, uh, we had wells here at the fort, but they also got their water out of the river. Um, so a lot of it's just drinking bad water, things like that. Uh, there are a few gunshot wounds, things like that, but by far it's illness. In the fort's time, there's uh, about 68 soldiers who die. Uh, I believe it's over 70% of them die from illness. Very few of them actually die from, from combat. So this is the... Um, uh, the doctor's office, so to speak? Yeah, the post surgeon's office. So he's the, the fort doctor. Um, he'll have the assistance of a hospital steward um, who does a lot of the paperwork. He's also the pharmacist. Uh, so you'll see there's the operating table in here. There's uh, the work table for him uh, to do his paperwork. And then as you, as you keep panning around the room, you'll see the, the pharmacy area where they had all the bottles of medicine. Of course, today when you go to the pharmacy, you get a pill that's all compacted together. Back then they'd have the ingredients in the bottles mixed together, what you need. Uh, but this is the bakery. Uh, as part of their daily ration, soldiers did get uh, bread. Now there was a weird army rule too at the time that if, uh, and it's not just at Fort Larned, it's army-wide, army that you couldn't eat fresh bread. Uh, they thought, I guess, that it would create stomach issues if the yeast was still active. So they had, they actually have a room to the side here uh, where they would have the bread sit out for a couple days to dry until they could finally eat it. So they didn't even get fresh bread. That's stale fresh bread. 
Dale Fresh Bread. Yep. Uh, so of course we have a carpenter here at the fort. Uh, the army has lots of wagons that need to be maintained. We have lots of buildings to maintain as well. Um, I tell school groups again when we're in here, there's there's no power tools. There's no outlets in here. Everything's done by hand. So it's not only the carpentry shop, but back here is a leather working area. We call it the saddlery shop. Um, so you could do any kind of leather working on their saddles or even some of their wagon pieces that use leather, things like that. Now, I mean, every room we've been in has had a stove, a wood stove. So you need a lot of wood throughout the year, um, warmth and cooking in the, the wintertime mm -hmm. and, and cooking in the summertime or whatnot. Was there a constant detail going out to, to bring back firewood? Absolutely. So sometimes we detail soldiers. Uh, they actually eventually go to using contracts to bring in firewood, but yeah, they would have to go several miles away and find a grove of trees and cut it down and chop it up and bring it back. And we know too, when they build these buildings, all of the rafters and the big wooden pieces, which this building has the original rafters, uh, the wood is actually brought in from Michigan, uh, shipped, shipped in by wagon, of course, uh, because you're not going to find big, tall, strong trees like this out here. Okay, so the blacksmith, of course, works with, with steel here during this time period. Uh, they did have two forges in here. We actually have one of the original ones is still here. Uh, we at Fort Larned actually have a blacksmith still today uh, who comes out and, and is here pretty much every weekend uh, doing demonstrations for visitors and things like that. Does he work in here? Yeah, he actually works in here. He'll make chain links, he'll make hooks, things like that to demonstrate his, his practice for visitors. Of course, he's using coal for his forge and he's heating up the metal so it gets hot and can be worked. And because it's dark in here, he can see the different colors in the metal to be able to tell the heat when it's ready to work. So if there was a tool he didn't have, he'd just make it himself. Uh, if the fort needed chains or hooks or anything like that, he can make it. Uh, one common question we get is, is did he make horseshoes or ox shoes? Uh, during this time period, no. They were actually commercially made by that point. Uh, so the blacksmith, he's mostly going to work on chains. He's also going to be fixing wagons. So you think a wagon, of course, is made out of wood, but it actually has a steel tire on the outside of the wood to help preserve it. And when the wood gets wet or it gets dry, it shrinks or expands and it loses that tire. So you actually have to resize the tire. So he can pull, pull the tire off, measure it with a tool he has, and resize the tire. In the blockhouse's lifetime, it has several different missions. So first of all, this is the only building that's reconstructed at the fort. Uh, but it's actually built with 300 plus original stones. Uh, we know that when it was a ranch, they tore it down and they actually used some of the stones to shore up the fortunes underneath Officer's Row. So we put them back. Uh, but when they first built this building, it's actually built for defense. So there's 100 rifle holes uh, throughout this building on two levels. And if the fort were to be attacked, they could barricade the door shut uh, and take up a spot and defend the fort. Now they were worried that if that happened and they got stuck in here, they'd need access to water. So underneath this building, there's actually a tunnel uh, and it goes down to a well, and there's no exit, because if there was an exit, you'd have to defend that too. So it's, it's just one way in and one way out, uh, so they could access to water, have access to water. Yeah, you mentioned a, a jail. I mean, did they actually use this to keep uh, prisoners from roaming too far? They could. So say you're allowed out of here, some, some, depending on your crime, sometimes it would be sentences where you go out on the fort and do your daily chores and then come back here at night. Uh, if you were a flight risk, they might put that on you. So it's actually welded around your foot, so the blacksmith would have to put a well to hold it together. So that wouldn't be too fun to take it back off either. Uh, but uh, a heavy fall like this, of course, would, would really slow you down. Yeah, you're not going to be very far. So commissary is food storage. So we saw in the barracks they did all the cooking over there in the kitchens. Uh, but when you have 400 soldiers, and again, civilian on top of that, you need a lot of food to supply them. Uh, now here at the fort, you can see when gazing around the room, you can kind of see some of the different foods they would have. Uh, we have the barrels full of uh, different foods. If you look, especially all of, almost all of them start with the word salt or salted. Uh, of course, there's no refrigerators at the time. Uh, we did have an ice house um, for the officers and things, but uh, for the most part, there's no refrigeration. So everything that's shipped in, salted to preserve it. And there were some, some livestock here. Um, their gardens were behind officers row. We actually have Still today, we have a historic garden back there that we plant and interpret. Um, and some years, we know from the records, grew really well, and other years, they didn't get anything. Right, so we're in the arsenal. Of course, this is storage for anything explosive, so your bullets, your gunpowder, 
uh, your cannonball rounds, things like that could be stored in here. Uh, the cannon that we're here at is called a mountain howitzer. It's a 12 pound howitzer, meaning it shoots a, a solid 12 pound cannonball. And we know from Fort Rutgers they had four of them. Uh, so we do actually still have four here at Fort Learned today. We have the two here and then a couple outside. Uh, and we actually still fire these today. Um, howitzers were perfect for the, for the prairie. Uh, because they're a lot smaller than an everyday cannon that you see. They're a lot lighter mm -hmm. uh, and you can move them easier through the dirt path back here. So you have you have the, the cannon carriage here and it's attached to a, a cart there we call a limber. Uh, the limber holds uh, basically your rounds. It holds your cannonballs in those ammunition chests there. And when you're ready to fire it, you actually separate them, of course, because you don't want your explosives next to your cannon. Uh, but we, again, still fire these today uh, when we have events and things like that. Uh, we have a crew that's trained up, and of course we fire blanks today, but uh, we still shoot out a half a pound of black powder out of one of these. So we do summer holidays as our main one, so we do Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day are our main events. Um, sometimes, occasionally, we'll have smaller events where we do it. Uh, we also, not only we do cannon firing, but we also fire some of our rifles that they had here historically as well. So we're here in the Quartermaster Warehouse. Uh, this is storage essentially for anything that's provided by the Army that isn't food and isn't explosive. We just saw those. Uh, so that could be uniform pieces, uh, pots and pans, uh, tents, ropes, nails, there's even coffins in this building. Uh, but everything back here, because it's paid for by the Army, has to be accounted for. So if you're an everyday soldier, you're not allowed in this part of the warehouse. You actually have to go to a different room, we call it the issue room. So we were just back in the warehouse part, which is right behind us. Uh, again, if you're an everyday soldier, you can't go back there. So if you needed a uniform item or anything provided by the Army, you'd come in through the front door to the counter here, give the clerk your paperwork, and they would issue it to you. Uh, so you can see we have all sorts of uniform pieces. There's canteens, there's candles, blankets, um, anything like that. Uh, the quartermaster who's in charge of this building is not only in charge of all of these supplies, but he's also in charge of the civilians who work here, like the blacksmith, the army scouts, things like that. Uh, so he even has an office space back here for some clerks. Uh, we know uh, Buffalo Bill Cody actually is a clerk here at one point. Uh, so he works right in this room. So uh, here at the fort, they use bugle calls throughout the day to tell you to get up, to go to breakfast, to go to drill, uh, to go to bed, things like that. And then if you're out on the battlefield, they use sounds to tell you to move left or right or retreat, things like that. The buildings no longer exist, but there was what we call a sutler's complex. It's basically a general store. Uh, and he could sell to both army, uh, he could sell both the soldiers, he could sell the civilians on the Santa Fe Trail. And we actually had two at one point. Ideally a fort this size usually has one. Uh, but for some reason we had two. And one of them actually had a one lane bowling alley. Uh, <laughs> the other one had a billiards table, so they could hang out in there. Um, that actually is an interesting story too, because uh, we here at Fort Learned had Buffalo soldiers. Right. And in 1869, uh, or, uh, yeah, late 1868, 1869, uh, there's an argument actually in the Sutler store between some of the Buffalo soldiers and some of the white soldiers, and there's a fight there. And uh, after the fight, the commanding officer here at the time finds out, and he sentenced the Buffalo soldiers to go guard the woodpile for the night. Uh, and this is on uh, New Year's Day, actually, 1869, when they go out there. Uh, and while they're out there, the stables mysteriously catch fire and burn to the ground. And uh, instead of diving deep into an investigation, the commanding officer actually decides to move the Buffalo soldiers, to move them to another fort, uh, instead of investigating. Uh, here at Fort Learned, uh, we of course have companies, uh, we have four companies, and each company has ideally three officers. Uh, they have a captain and two lieutenants. Uh, and then above them we have a major, who's the commanding officer of the whole fort. Uh, but your rank determined how much space you got. So we are in Captain Nolan's quarters. Uh, Captain Nolan was a white officer for the Buffalo Soldiers. And uh, because he's a captain, he gets a whole side of a house. He gets three rooms. Uh, we have the parlor area where we're standing. We have a bedroom behind us and then the kitchen beyond that. If you're a lieutenant, uh, you would just get one room. So you close these doors right here and this would be your whole space. That would be your living room, your, your bedroom, and your kitchen all in one. Well, Brian, thanks so much. It's been a great tour, and uh, I look forward to coming back. So for National Parks Traveler from Fort Barnett National Historic Site, this is Kurt Revencheck.